Great. Thank you for uh, having me and everyone for setting up this topic <clears throat> so well. Um, my name is Michael Pashuorlo. I'm from uh, Boston Medical Center, Boston University School of Medicine. I'm a general internist. Most of my research is on the role of health literacy in health outcomes. Um, I get attracted to things that are complicated for patients. So this is a wonderful area of research for me. The consent process is really very fun. Um, uh, I also get attracted to, to areas where there's really a, a, a failure, a lack of shared meaning. Um, and, you know, it's another marker that there's a lot of trouble um, and, and, and good stuff to be done. So um, that being said, uh, I'm going to start with some topics that you've already been hearing about and hope to do, uh, show some interesting things there. But um, really, there's a massive gap in shared meeting. So uh, just about literacy in the United States, um, the average reading level in English is between 8th and ninth grade. And um, I, I really, I love this topic. I could spend lots of time talking to you about it. I'm going to bully on through. This is the data from the National uh, Assessment of Adult Literacy. And one of the things I want you to, to take away from this, from this kind of a slide is that um, there's a huge relationship between uh, access and attainment of education and adult literacy skills. Um, but there's also a massive impact of uh, other types of social determinants. So in fact, really, when you think about uh, literacy, <clears throat> you should also really think about uh, justice considerations. Because in fact, there's a very, very large uh, ethnic and racial gap in literacy, a very, very large uh, economic gap in literacy. And so um, the whole conversation we're having here really has another whole lens to it, which is about social justice and how it is, what does it mean that we have a you know 20 page consent form or what is that going to do in society. So um, I, did a, I did a fun project years ago. I, I'm, uh, I can embarrass Holly, who started off the day. She was part of this project as well. Um, and basically, um, we looked at the readability for the consent templates that were out there. Now, it is actually part of the statutes that the um, IRB should in ensure that the consent forms are written in a language that subjects can understand. That's not only the right language, but also understandable to them, like not too complicated. That's how it's been interpreted. Um, but we, um, we felt that, that at least it looked like that the templates that were being put out there were really um, much more complicated than it needed to be. OK, so uh, we looked at the informed consent form read readability standards that IRBs were putting out there versus the actual readability of their templates. So um, just by, you know, I had, a, I had a young baby, and we had a, I had a brand new internet-like thing at night. I could like type and search on websites, and uh, I could find all this stuff just freely online. And I was able to see that most, most places out there had a readability standard of, of eighth grade. Now, why should there be an eighth grade readability standard? I already told you the average reading skill level in the United States is between eighth and ninth grade. So right off the bat, it's kind of a cynical standard to have. But even if you're going to have it, um, we found that the templates themselves were written much higher than that. So this is something I would call the hypocrisy index. Okay, so this is what the, the picture of the hypocrisy index. Basically, it means that the institutions themselves are promulgating language that doesn't fit their own standards. The message to investigators is, we're fudging it. The message to the research staff is, we understand that this isn't being actually done. Okay, so this was a, this was a, well, this was a while ago. So we did it again, about 10, 10 years later. This is the, the redux, right? Looking back at it again. And in fact, actually, it got a little better. You know, the templates got a little better. Still not nearly as good as they should be. Um, and uh, here's, here's the hypocrisy index. Oop, there it is. Um, a little better. But this, this graph here is without HIPAA. Okay. So one of the things that happened, I was so happy that you had a HIPAA session earlier, is because um, the HIPAA is actually much worse. The language is really, really a shambles. Um, the average is 4.2 grade levels above the institution's own standards. And here's the hypocrisy index for the HIPAA language itself. Okay. But I don't want to talk to you about readability. I think it's boring at this point. Because um, it's not really about the form. It's got to be about the process. I'm not the first person to say it. And in the end, it would be cynical not to make the forms better. But we're not going to get as far as we need to by just focusing on the forms. Um, so. Uh, my first recommendation, of course, is to shorten the forms. And I, 
I was actually very happy that you that um, you you kind of liked the the risk section of the new template. I was actually on that committee for NCI. Very happy about that. But it's still, they're way too long, way too long. And uh, when people talk about um, you know what people can tolerate to process, you know you have people not at their best, um, physically not at their best, emotionally not at their best. And you know it's actually a very, very hard task, all the cognitive processing that's going to be required. Massively need to simplify the forms. But it's not about the form in the end. Readability will only be part of the, part of the answer. Um, and I, I have many, many examples where there's a lack of shared meaning. And there's so many, so many fun things to, if you just talk to patients, you're going to hear what they say. I mean, if you say to patients, for example, what is this, uh, you know, it says here in this form that the investigator is a part owner of the company. Uh, you know, that, you know, for whatever reason, disclosure is considered the mechanism, one of the main mechanisms to managing conflicts of interest. And if you ask patients what they think that means, some of them will say, wow, I didn't realize he was such a big shot. I should be in this study. He's a big shot. Okay. You know, so you just have to talk to people and find out what they think these things mean. And they don't actually fulfill your agenda necessarily about, uh, about the about what you thought the meaning was. Uh, for example, I had a focus group once just to, just to ask the question, what does it mean when you say you don't have to be in the study? If you're not in the study, you won't lose any of the health benefits that you would have otherwise, right? I mean, it, you, whatever. So, um, you know, a, a couple of people started telling me that this was a veiled threat. A veiled threat. How is this a veiled threat? I was like, no, no, no. The language means that you won't lose any of the benefits. And one of the guys said to me, well, say I have this parking spot as part of my apartment, and I don't put out my garbage, and that piece, the people who are in charge of my building come over and say, you don't put out your garbage, we're going to take away your, your park. You, if, you take, if you put your garbage away, we won't take your parking spot away. I was like, I just didn't get it. So I went to a friend of mine who's a teacher, and he said, Michael, you're being dense. Listen, it's like this. I'm the professor in the classroom. And I say to my students in the classroom, I have this research study. You, won't, you don't have to be in this study. It won't affect your grade. OK? So now, you, now, even more so for the person wearing a white coat that you think that you're in this therapeutic adventure with. So um, let me just bully on, because I have um, uh, the basic message here is if you don't check, you don't know what the person understands. You just don't know. So I want to shift the paradigm from persuasion, which I think by listening to audio tapes is the dominant model for what is happening in the consent process now to pedagogy. If you listen to audio tapes of what people who are doing the consent process, the dominant model is persuasion. And I think we have to shift to pedagogy. And here's some things. I think it's actually an awesome opportunity for values clarification in the community of people who do research trials is to flip the default towards it is now your responsibility to confirm comprehension. Okay, so the, current, the current standard is if the patient wants to know more, they have to ask questions. Now, you can hear on audio tips, you can hear, patient, you can hear the consenting folks, you can hear them say, do you have any questions? But I, I submit to you that that is not an honest play at interaction with this person. That actually usually leads to a verbal dominant interaction, which is just dominated by the person doing the consent process. If I say to you, OK, blah, 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 we talked for 45 minutes. Amazing, I spoke for 45 minutes. And now I say, do you have any questions? The answer is no. That, the, that's what's been trained for people. If you, have, if you want to make an honest play at eliciting the questions, and there are always questions, you have to evaluate their comprehension. You'll be able to find out that there's all kinds of misunderstandings and fears and worries and, and things that are you know, really, really substantively important for them to learn. So um, my third strong recommendation really is to require comprehension of comp confirmation of comprehension as an entry criteria for studies. If the person, you know, it's not just about readability. People will have fixed false beliefs. And if you evaluate their comprehension, you may not be able to get them past them. You know, the consent documents say, for example, that research-related injury won't be compensated. But if you talk to people, they frequently assume that, of course, they will be. Actually, if you talk to the PIs, they also think they will be. Right? There's, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. If you, look, if you say to people, if you say to PIs, or to patients, potential subjects, you know, if you get into this research study and you're, you, know, you have a allergic reaction, you go to the emergency room, who's going to pay for that bill? If you ask them, they say, of course you're going to pay for that bill. We say, look, right here it says that you won't be paid for. So people have fixed false beliefs. And if you can't get them past their false beliefs, then you're not communicating adequately. All right. 
So uh, what does it mean to shift towards pedagogy? So I, I think what it means is that we have to develop a core of adult educators. Um, so the question is going to be, what is the training, supervision, quality assurance needed, and the tools needed to support, create and support the, this core of adult educators? And um, really, this is an opportunity for professional development. Um, I think this is actually going to be hard to do, but can be embraced by the research community, because it will reaffirm the values of, of, of what they're doing there. Um, so I, another recommendation I would have is that we should have a, a national survey of the training, supervision, and documentation approaches to cr that are already being used in, in support of this concept of um, the enrolling process not being about persuasion but being about pedagogy. What are the adult learning theories that can be applied to this scenario? And that's in service of my next recommendation, which is to establish a model training program that can be elaborated across um, organizations out there. Uh, and I have specific ideas, but I don't, you know about how that might, what that might look like. But really, what's more important is actually that campuses would engage in the professional development needed. So again, as I said, if you want to, if you want a result, you have to check it. You know, if you go to McDonald's and you say, uh, you say your order, they they know what to do. You say, I would like fries and a coke. They say, you want to get a larger one. You know, no, they say that's fries and a coke. They say it back to you because they want to confirm that they get it right. They know that they're in a service industry and that they're going to be judged if they, have a bad, if they don't do the right thing. So that's flipping the fault. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I have a next set of slides that are about, are about this concept called teach to goal or teach back, which is one of the adult learning mechanisms to confirm comprehension. I'm going to go through it really fast just to give you a flavor because I actually want to get to the next topic. But this is one method for uh, confirming uh, that pe patients understand. And this has been adopted in many other settings. I think it can be adopted in this context as well. You start with a phrase like, you know, it's my job to explain things clearly to make sure that I did this. I want to I hear wh what your understanding is about this research. It's not the patient's fault. You know, it's your job to, to make sure that you succeed with this. Now, um, you make sure that the, the potential subject actually has understood. And, um, you know, you have to allow time to, this is not a memory test. They can look at the documents. They can ask you questions. You have to make this an interactive experience. And, um, but there are some, there are some pitfalls. Um, some of the uh, tools that have been used for comprehension tests have like yes, no question, yes, no answers. And so you can, you have to pay attention to when people are just parroting back using complex concepts that maybe they don't actually understand. For example, randomization. It's not simply the concept of randomization. Um, several studies have shown that patients don't think that it's a moral thing to be doing. They don't understand the basic concept of how randomization works in trials and why it'd be scientifically relevant. And even after that, even after you go through that, they may say, oh, but he's such a nice doctor. He'll make sure that I'm in the right side of this study. He was a nice doctor, don't you think? All right. So um, you have to, it's got to be about open-ended questions. So for, for example, tell me in your own words, or um, what do you expect to gain? You know, what risk would you be taking? You just, you know, there's, there's just actually not, not so hard, but you have to, this is actually a skill. You have to actually practice this. Um, you can't just show people, up, you can't show your research nurses this document and then expect them to go do it. You actually have to practice it. Simulations, they're quite useful. And then actually you want people to do this. You have to show that you care. So supervision, and you have to observe that they're still doing it three months later, a year later, and that they're documenting this. I'm just going to bully on ahead here. All right. These are just other sections. And then when you hear what people say, you have to correct their misinformation. You have to talk with them. No, 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 actually, you can leave this study. And, how, and, and what that would mean, what that would look like in that particular study. Now, if you do this confirmation of, of comprehension business, I think it can shift the goal, the role and the goal of the uh, research, the, the enrolling folks. And it can also shift the culture of, of, of research rec recruitment, like I said, towards uh, being sure that you're actually in a, in a pedagogic role. And it also would provide an opportunity for, to, to monitor, because you'll have a document trail about comprehension. And you know, guess what? Maybe we'll start to recruit folks who actually understand the studies. People worry about this kind of work, because they worry that this will in negatively influence their enrollment. But I think that if you do this, you might see, actually, that you have better retention. 
people will understand better what studies they're getting into. Better, you know, uh, observance of the protocol as well. But that, that's an empirical question to be proven. Um, also, it will give feedback to the person. You know, if you're the teacher, you know, if you're the enrolling person and you're the teacher, it gives you feedback about what you're doing well and what you're not doing well so that you can improve. Right now, people get very little feedback about their own skill level. The only feedback they get is, you know, when the PI says, how many people did you enroll? And that's a bit of a fox guarding the chicken situation, um, which I, maybe we'll talk about a little more later. So now I'm moving into a next topic, which is one of the tools that I've been working to develop in this space. So I've, um, as a kind of an intervention mechanism, uh, educational platform, I and colleagues have been developing what we call embodied conversational agents. These are uh, computer, you know, avatar type things, emulating face-to-face -face communication. And we use touch screens, but you can also do a mouse point and click. And this would be done in advance to help uh, in advance of the consent process that you would do with a human. And so um, I'm going to give you some, some examples. Um, when, you, when I do this with subjects, or potential subjects, or whatever, our subjects in our studies, um, you know, they, it's a, they're, they're de deciding what the, where the conversation goes. I was just going to give you some video clips of some examples, if I can get this to work. OK, so in this first clip, what I want you to notice is this is just like an introductory clip, is to notice the, the alliance of the pronouns. I'll explain what I mean in a second. This image shows how the chemotherapy treatment is given for people in this study. Wrong one, wrong one. You are being asked by the research team to be in a research study. I would like to work with you to make sure you understand everything you need to know to see if being in this study is a good decision for you. But then the, the, the you may have seen consent forms before. They can be long and complicated. My job is to help you understand as much as possible. Later, if you are still interested in the study, you will also talk with members of the research team to help answer any questions you may still have. Let me get to know you a little bit. Have you ever been in a research study before? I see. I hope the experience was good. I see. I am sorry to hear that. If you choose to be in any more research studies, I certainly hope you have a better experience. Well, I see uh, you guys didn't get any video. Let us walk through the cons You are being asked by the research team to be in a research. Okay, I'm just going to abandon that and see if I can get it to work here. Here we go. Okay. You're being asked by the research team to be in a research okay. study. You get, you get this one. Okay. I would like to work with you to make sure you understand. Okay, you got that one. So the, the, uh, the basic notion, though, is um, the way we've rendered this character is uh, very cartoonish. But, um, and the voice isn't perfect either. But what we see is after three turns back and forth that subjects jump right into the experience. We've done studies in a var various settings. Uh, behavioral modification studies to pr promote walking and the elderly and stuff like that. And literally, when you start with this subject, you, they, you, put it, you put it in front of them and you say, and she walks on and waves. And then half the patients that we're working with, I'm at Boston Medical Center, elderly patients, never touch the computer. They walk up and they wave back. <laughs> and now he's, oh, you, oh you, you touch the screen here. And then, then they can do it. Then they're touching the screen. If, if, you know, if they can do that, they can, they can use the system. Now, the, the um, the idea with this particular vignette that I wanted to point out was, um, other than when a human comes in, um, the alliance that we're, uh, we're depicting in this scenario is that this character is an advocate for this potential subject. And I, I submit to you that actually what happens when most research nurses come in the room wearing a white coat, bringing on the imprimatur of the whole therapeutic team, is that that person is actually aligned with the research team. And there's a whole set of questions you can ask about what, is it, what makes sense here 
um, and what role should we be having in terms of advocating and empowering patients. And there are things you can do with these kinds of systems that are kind of fun. Let me just give you another, another uh, example or two. Um, okay, here's, a, here's one about... GCSF can cause severe allergic reaction, but is rare. Less than one-tenth of one percent of patients will have this problem. So how do you communicate about this concept? One Let us talk about what that means. This is a picture of a thousand people. If all of them took GCSF, among them, one person would be expected to have an allergic reaction to GCSF. However, it could be any of these people. The research team does not know in advance. As you get that idea. Um, this is just in service of the NCI template, which is actually in the table here shows side effects which will happen occasionally for people who are in this study. Some may be serious. Please review this list. Let us talk about what that means. Here is a picture of 100 people. If 100 people got full fox, between 4 and 20 of these people would get the side effects. However, it could be any of these people. The research team does not know in advance. So what I wanna, what, one of the things I want to get across is that if you don't actually go through these things like really concretely like this, a lot of people won't understand what you're talking about. You don't have to do that with every single one of the risks, but by doing this, you can see where the person is and understand what they're understanding or not understanding. This can drive uh, interactions. And, and the last clip I'm just going to show um, is just another uh, two, two types of features that, that we commonly use. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that if you sign the form, you will have to stay in the study for the whole time? I am sorry you feel that way. Actually, in fact, if you choose to be in this study, you could quit any time. Yes, really. You could quit the study at any time. You mentioned before that you had been in an earlier study and were not satisfied. You know, if you choose to join this study and then found you were not happy, you could withdraw. If you tell the research team, they will help you leave the study in a way that is safe for you. So um, th I just want to show there's a, there's a few things that you can do. One is uh, you can remember, of course, what people told you earlier. And uh, that, you know, that was a uh, data bit that she had told us earlier, that the char character learned earlier. And, um, and one of the funny things is when I listen to audio tapes of humans doing these experiences, they actually rarely personalize. They rarely actually bring information that they brought up earlier in the conversation. These are often hour-long conversations, uh, you know, consent processes. But the nurses or the research staff is frequently in a script themselves. And they have many opportunities to personalize that they don't choose those options. Um, and opportunities for empathy. Um, you know, it's just software. You can make it do whatever you want. But we've, uh, we've uh, done several different pro uh, projects where we've altered the amount of empathy expressed emotion that the character uses. And it turns out that there are two categories of people that particularly like this, the people with lower literacy and the people with depression. And they spend more time, ask more questions, if you, if you amp up the empathy side of it. And listening to audio tapes of providers, they're kind of mean. If you, you know, they're kind of mean. You, li you literally will have situations where people will say, I just want to learn more about your family. You know, for example, is your father alive? No. Okay, what did he die from? Cancer. Oh, how about your mother? Well, you know, come on. Like, you know, this person just told you this father died of cancer, and you say nothing back about it? It's like, you know, very strange. It's, it's about the culture of medicine uh, or in general, and I think we can do better. And the last section of this work that we'll be pursuing is I think that when you put these tools into this context, I think we will impact the way the humans are interacting as well because they'll see that there's a new standard of, of how you interact with people, that you should express empathy when it's appropriate. You should actually not align yourself in the therapeutic misconception uh, too badly. Anyway, I'm going to stop. I went over my time. Thank you.